Well, welcome everyone. We're just going to, as we do every week, we're just going to stand by and wait for our participants, uh, our registered participants to join in today's webinar. Uh, this is the webinar on the new Fontaine de Joe Samana 59, which we probably would have preferred to have been doing standing on the yacht overseas, but with current situation, we, uh, we've resorted to sharing our information today over a webinar with some pictures and videos and in the background we've got some uh, some of our experienced team members uh, and we're looking forward to uh, presenting this very impressive Samana 59 to uh, to the market. Um, we'll just wait a couple of minutes as we do each week on our webinars before we move forward. Uh, we'll just uh, have a few people registered to attend today and if anyone does miss this then we'll have it up on YouTube in the coming weeks uh, and it will be there as a resource to uh, go back and refer to. So I'm just going to jump over the next slide. Uh, our next webinar, we're changing the days now of our webinars from Fridays to Thursdays and the next one will be on the 3rd of December, uh, which again I think is you. Uh, Michael, Nod, uh, and I will be talking from all of our experience of uh, living and sailing around the Sundays over the years. We're going to present that as a cruising area. Two weeks ago, we did the Southwest Pacific uh, with John from Down Under Sailing, and it was uh, a terrific presentation. So the benchmark's been set high. On the Thursday, the 17th of December, we're going to be doing uh, a liveaboard cruising tips from an owner. Very excited about that one. One of our most popular webinars this year, earlier this year was with Michael and Marita Lysart about tips to cruising the Mediterranean. And I expect that this little board cruising uh, webinar on the 17th of December will also be very popular. Uh, now, today, as we do uh, with all of our webinars, if you want to ask some questions, please go ahead. And the way to do that is by clicking on your Q&A button on your screen. Uh, we really do welcome questions and this webinar today is one where we expect to uh, be engaging quite uh, quite a lot with our participants to ask questions and uh, point out things and uh, I'm sure if you're thinking of purchasing the Samana 59 you've probably got a list of questions already so don't hesitate to ask. Now, myself, I'm Greg Boller. I'm the uh, New York Sales Manager here at Multi Hole Solutions. In the background, producing our webinars as she does every fortnight is Rachel Crook. And our main presenters today is my colleague, Michael Nod Crook. Yes, they are related. Uh, and uh, as you can see, Michael's been with, uh, he's our Chief Operating Officer and has been with Multi Hole Solutions for many, many years and has been commissioning New Fontaine Peugeot's, whether it be at the factory in France or here in Australia or in New Zealand or in Thailand uh, for over 20 years. So I would blow smoke up, uh, up the proverbial there, not and say you're probably one of the most experienced Fontaine Peugeot people in the world. And it's really good to have you with us today. And then supporting act is Marcus Ashley Jones, who is our New South Wales sales manager. And he's been helping clients, as it says there, uh, finding their dream boats for over 10 years and has sold uh, with uh, before joining us at Multi Hall Solutions three or four years ago, has also sold some of the larger competing models. So it's good to have him with us today to give us some comparence and some oversight of uh, how the Samana 59 uh, stacks up against other models. And... Marcus is a competitive sailor. If you're on Sydney Harbour, he's been winning quite a few of the skiff races on the harbour lately. And at Christmas time, he'll be heading south. What, what yacht are you going south on this year, Marcus? Yeah, thanks, Greg. Uh, heading south on an 80 foot uh, camping tour boat. Uh, Beautiful. Still so, uh, Beautiful. So. Very good. So here she is, the Samana 59. Um, this is a yacht that we've been waiting to see for quite some time. Uh, it was launched uh, earlier this year in the middle of COVID and hence why we're doing what we're doing today because we were expecting to all be in Cannes in France 
for the boat show in September to be sailing on the boat and doing walkthrough YouTube videos and so on. Uh, but we haven't been able to do that. And so the next best thing is to have a good look at the boat. And I'd like to just pass over to Nod now and get your thoughts on what you're seeing there on the screen. Thank you, Greg, and uh, welcome to everyone who's tuned in to watch us this afternoon. As Greg said, it is a bit odd doing a review on a boat that uh, is already out and on the water, and none of us working here have actually physically stood on it. Uh, so I guess most of my remarks will be comparisons to the previous model, the Ipanema, and then some references to the, the 57 before that, just in some comparisons in the evolution, uh, both uh, aesthetically and technically of the new boats. I guess just staring at the Smana there sitting on the water. Um, obviously it's just following the trend of the new design and the, the Allegra before it, the 67 is we've got those new lines with those reverse bows. Um, I guess the standout is just the freeboard on these boats. So even though a comparable length, just the height of the boats off the water. So when we look at that, the freeboard, we're at 2.38 metres on the Samana on the specs, comparable to, to 2.1. So it might not sound, sound like much, but an extra you know, two thirds of a foot higher above the waterline to the deck level. Um, and then glaringly obvious is that foredeck. We can't see it from here, but the flybridge has evolved significantly. And we'll probably talk about it a bit later on with this boat, but the flybridge has evolved significantly and that living area now holds a big sun lounge area, which has opened up the bow of the boats to a complete new living area. So there's a door which isn't overly visible there in the picture, but a door that slides across, allowing walk through single level from the saloon area, straight out into this open plan seating, um, I guess, four deck lounge area. So that, those are my uh, sort of standouts and just looking at the, the boat from here, Greg. And then what we've got too is on this next slide nod is the um, previous model. So we can do a bit of flicking backwards and forwards between the two images here. Yeah. And maybe you and Marcus can have a chat about that. Well, I've just, I know, yeah, and that's actually good that we've got this slide here because I've spent a lot of time on the Sanya 57 and the, the Ipanema, which is the evolution of the same hull, uh, but moving the helm station upstairs. Um, it never felt like an overly comfortable flybridge up there because the standard, as you can see from that photo, there was just a very small bimini area around that, that helm pod. Uh, and then further aft over the back seat, back seating, there was another steel frame uh, canvas bimini uh, with the evolution of the new boat that we saw in the previous slide. You can see that there's now an option of a full fiberglass hardtop, which covers the whole of the area. Um, and you can see, well, you can't see from this photo, but it doesn't extend all the way aft. And so you've got that big sun lounge area. Uh, I guess in just the styling, I mean, at the time a few years ago, this boat looked as modern as anything else in the market, but you can see we've just got the straight bows on the older design boat. And um, I guess already starting to look a bit dated. Yeah, um, so just following on from Nod there, um, you know, the thing that grabs me most uh, is I've been working with these bigger cats for some years now and, you know, selling the Lagoon 620s and the 60 foot sun reefs. And they're always a, a really good platform, uh, ent entertaining family and friends. But it was always hard to make these big cats look uh, sexy, I guess, in a way. And I think it's something that FP with their styling and, uh, and the way they've molded these boats, it just, it's a beautiful looking boat. Um, and then to bring all the new function in there with the, the, uh, the walk through into the forward cockpit with the door, um, it just makes it such a, a beautiful boat, I'm sure to sit on and enjoy, but also look at. Um, that's probably the biggest trend I've, I've seen over the last few years, especially with Fontaine Peugeot. Yeah, very good. And then um, what we'll do now, as we had planned, is I'll just jump through. I'm just going to go exit full screen here. And I'm just going to click on the, the web here and click on this video, which...
So you can hear me there, Nod? Yes, I can hear you, Greg. Yeah, so um, you might want to have a chat about what you're seeing here as we as the video plays through. Is that the boat or the ladies, Greg? <laughs> Whichever <laughs> one you like. I was actually going to... It was actually going through my mind when we were just watching the, the, the video of the boat underway there, and uh, I was going to come up with some stats of um, um, power to sail area or weight to sail area, and uh, this boat is actually um, a lot more powerful, um, power to weight ratio on the water than the previous models. But uh, I was going to ask Marcus what kind of figures he's asking for, you know, when this boat, if your passage making, or what kind of average speeds you're getting out of a boat if this this length, 59 feet. Yeah, no, you'd be you'd be hoping to average anywhere from sort of seven to 10 knots on a, on a cruising passage comfortably. But in saying that, if you're, um, you know, out in some great breeze and you've got a Jenica and a mainsail like we can see there now, uh, no problem surfing on waves, you know, 15, 16, 17, up to 20 knots. And um, that's something the autopilot would handle quite comfortably. Um, and I guess when you start talking about performance here, the layout of that cock, uh, the, the flybridge, you've got the central helm station um, with the winches on either side. So quite an easy boat to um, sail and handle and you're not sort of leaning over anybody or anyone in the way on a sun pad or anything. It's quite an easy boat to actually sail. I guess when we look at this boat, we're just talking about the size of this now. We've got you know more superstructure up top with this fly and that hard top I was talking about, forward seating areas. Is this boat has gone up significantly? Uh, I guess in freeboard height, height of the vessel. But to counter that with making it sail at equivalent or better boat speeds is is we've actually got a much bigger rig on this boat. Um, and much bigger sail area on this boat. So to give you guys some stats while we're just looking at this is we've got a, a main sail area of 115 square metres to the previous 102 on the Ipanema and quite a significant, we're carrying a furling Genoa there, 88 square metre Genoa comparable to 67 on the previous model. So you can see quite a bit more horsepower, much taller rig than the previous boats as well because a lot of people ask the question, with the raised boom, uh, is that going to jeopardise sail area, depower the boat? And the answer to that is no. Yeah, we'll, we'll work through the performance. Uh, I believe we've got another slide there with uh, some polars and, and things. But um, yeah, it's a really um, well thought out and laid out boat uh, for getting the the ease of sailing right, but also the comfort with the sun back now and at the back of the flybridge, um, just making it all a, a bit more succinct. So Nod, we've now got this uh, sheet of data. Um, again, would you like to uh, just chat through there some of the differences? I know you've got a sheet of paper with you there with some comparisons to previous models. Well, it's quite interesting. I just did a bit of research by coming into this. Um, and so obviously these are the specs that we've got for Savannah in front of us, as I just touched on earlier, you can see that sail area, which is main sail, you know, and Jenica today. So all of those sail areas have gone up on this boat um, quite significantly, but we've only actually gone up with all the extra gear on board. It's only increased in weight by one tonne from the previous model. Um, and so I guess really the thing that the, the, the power to rate ratio is, is currently light ship on this boat sitting at 7.99, whereas it was 7.19 uh, for the previous model, the Ipanema. Um, so as I say, we've built a, a bigger boat, but waterline length, um, still comparable. Uh, well, actually, no, we said, actually, I'll correct myself there. We're almost a metre longer than the previous boat and the Ipanema. And that sail to weight ratio, uh, Marcus, um, is obviously a, a measure that's used across the, the industry. Um, what's your thoughts on that? I think my understanding is it's best in class. Exactly right there, Greg. Um, you know, a lot of people start talking performance and um, everybody can give you their opinion. But the key things you're looking at is the uh, weight of the boat, the sail area of the boat. Uh, and then the last thing that you need to take into account is the hull shape. 
um, how sort of deep and round are the bilges of the boat, the underwater hull form. Um, so this boat is obviously best in its class for performance. So um, traditionally the bigger cats haven't been big on the performance side of things, but uh, this one will certainly uh, feel quite sporty compared to its competitors in the 60 foot range. So before we jump off this page, Nod, a uh, couple of points there, things like dinghy sizes and so on. Yeah, so it's regularly asked, and this is some advantages that we do have when we start getting to our larger catamarans. So when we step up from the 50 foot, we're into the 59, and obviously the 67 above it. These are built in the flagship bar, uh, with a view to accommodating, I guess, crude tenders or larger tenders. And they actually have um, a lot of the time, what dictates the size of tender we can fit on the boat is one, the gap between the two hulls at the transom, what length of vessel we can fit in there, but the lifting gear. So we've got slightly different design lifters, uh, I guess on a lever system that go into the tunnel on both this and the bigger ship, these two flagship boats. So we've got plenty of room between the hulls, which allows us to lift a, a, up to four meter tender and also up to about 450, 500 kilos of lift weight, which means you can lift, uh, rather than just a, an open tender with, with an outboard, we can probably afford then power trim and tilt and maybe a center console in the vessel as well. And then while we're on this page also, um, there's obviously the standard engines of the, the two times 110s and then the power option of going up to the two 150s. That's a rather large horsepower. Yeah, it's a significant jump. Um, I guess so when you start talking to bigger boats, the horsepower seems like a significant jump. But when we look at the smallest in the fleet where we're jumping from a, a 30 to 40 and you work out percentage wise, it's probably comparable, Bola, you know. Um, and is it true to say too, Nod, that the um, no matter how big an engine you put in, that the, the, the speed of the vessel is determined by the whole design, isn't it? That's correct. So flat water, either of those engines is going to drive the boat up to hull speed. Uh, I'd imagine having never driven the boat, I can't tell you exactly having never driven the Samana, but I'd imagine we'd be uh, 10, 11 knots at, at sort of full throttle and, and that's kind of hull speed. So the 150s will do it comfortably. Uh, I guess better engine longevity, perhaps not working so hard if you are the kind of person that wants to passage make at speed. Generally, when ordering one of the boats, both of you are aware, but the first thing, which is normally a very reasonably priced upgrade, is the engine upgrade. It's very rare that we option one of our boats with the, the standard or the smaller engine. Yeah, no, I can confirm it's it's a, about a four thousand euro upgrade to the one hundred and fifties from the standard. So not a not a big step at all in the in the scheme of the uh, the size of the boat. And then two other points I'd like to make on this page before we move along. One is that it's built to category A, which I think is uh, excellent because that means that this boat is uh, categorised to be an ocean going vessel. Uh, so it's built to that safety and construction standard. And the other one is the um, uh, the air draft. Oh, sorry, the, um, uh, where are we there? The uh, underneath height, one metre. So you've got a nice tunnel. Uh, and so, yeah, there's, and also the max load. So, you know, it's got, it's been built to be loaded up with equipment and people and, uh, and still be safe. Yeah, you've got a, a ton of fresh water there, um, 1150 litres, um, you know, 1200 litres of, uh, of diesel. So it's, you can certainly load this one up for, for long range cruising around the world. Okay, so I think we've done, uh, spoken enough on that page, but it's very interesting. It's good information. Now, Marcus, you're the sailor amongst us. Uh, this screen here is a polar uh, screen, so this is yeah, about that's the performance. Right. On the uh, on the left there, you can see sort of a, a half circle with um, a bunch of lines. What what this call is called is a polar chart. So it actually shows us at different wind angles um, what the boat speed will be. Um, so you can see on the outside arc, they've got sort of 140, 130, 120. These are your wind angles. And then on through the middle, you can actually see the boat speed, which is 8, 10, 12, 14, 18. 
So what, what this is telling us here, Greg, um, take for example, at, at 90 true, sort of through the middle there, um, you, you've got your, your wind speed, uh, your wind angle, and then it'll give you your, your boat speed there. So um, just working it out there, it's sort of 18 knots, it's saying, uh, what are we doing there? About, uh, about 13, 14 knots. Mm. Can you hear me still? Sorry, I keep muting myself because I know my, my chair is squeaky. Um, <laughs> what, what I was saying is uh, if anyone would like to uh, get a copy of this poll art, just let us know and we can email it to you. That's not a problem. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's just good to know. And then as close as you can get, it's saying here, um, as close as you want to sail to the wind is about 50 degrees true. Um, and then as you sort of crack off to 90 to 100, you're going to get your maximum speed. And then going downwind, um, you know, obviously the, the more you go with the wind, um, you're going to end up a bit slower, but you might be sailing a more direct course to where you want to go perhaps. Um, so, yeah, interesting numbers there, Greg. Uh, certainly a lot faster than a lot of the competitors um, in the 60-foot cruising category. Okay, now we'll just, uh, from here on, we're going through quite a few slides. So we'll just talk and uh, walk through the slides. Uh, this, just while we're, sorry, just while we're just hanging on that for one more second, is I've just pulled up some stats, actually, when we just mentioned they're comparable to some of our competitors. And sail ratio, which is what we're looking at, the performance on those polars, is the, the new 59, and, and the, comparable to the gross tonnage of the boat, is so the new 59, um, full load is 7.15 compared to a Lagoon 560, 6.93, uh, and even a Lagoon 620, which is a, a bigger vessel than we're talking about here, 6.6. .6. So even if you do, just do that comparison of that sail area to weight of the boat, you're never going to get a polar that looks like that. Very good. Okay, so deck plan. We won't uh, ponder on this too much because we've seen it in the pictures. Uh, but obviously, one of the features here is on the specification seat. People, she, people can uh, choose to add a or basically almost a full kitchen up there on the flybridge uh, with the sink and the uh, the hot plate and fridges and so on. Uh, obviously, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, it, the way that the winches are laid out there at the helm it is very manageable from one um, one station. Uh, I know from when I was sailing on the Allegri 67, you've also got the, if you have the electric winch options, uh, it's all on the uh, foot switches. So you can stand there and uh, control the winches with your feet. Mm -hmm. um, and so in a, as you can also see, everything is feeding back from the mast uh, and even the, uh, the headsail controls and the main sheet controls, they're all coming forward to that central uh, helm station. Yeah, uh, that's right, Greg. <clears throat> traditionally, the, the 60 foot size boat is sort of in two categories where you might have one boat that's set up for a <laughs> hostess to sail, um, or it still could be a you know, husband and wife team um, doing some long range cruising. Um, so either way, the boat's set up for shorthanded sailing. Um, and, you know, you can have the skipper there, say, if, if it was skippered, um, you could have the skipper in the middle. He's got a great visibility all around the boat, um, but then quick, easy access forward to where the ropes are to adjust sails or put them up and down. Um, or out of the way, if guests are relaxing down the back on the sun pads while you're sailing between islands or, or what have you. And then another feature there is the solar uh, array. And then another feature there is also the fact that you can do a fully teak deck version as that diagram is showing. But we'll move along to the next slide. Yeah, I'll just, um, just while we're just while we're looking at that up there, it is the same feature, but that centralized helm station comparable to the helm being over on the starboard side, uh, just in driving the boat, parking the boats can make it a lot easier on this newer model. Uh, and I think they've got this flybridge finally right, or Fontaine have got it right previously uh, with the Ipanema. And, and well, the Sanya before didn't have a flybridge, but there was no point up there in the living area where there was that 
completed it around the lounge area. So even though there was a seating area across the back and one down the side, this fully enclosed seating area, and we just touched on it a minute ago, the fact that at the back of the flybridge, there's also the sun lounge area. Mm. Now on the previous boats, if you wanted to sun lounge, you were on the foredeck. And so it was often a bit detached, whereas this is certainly a standalone upstairs all day living area for everybody. And, and Marcus, you've got the uh, the spec sheet there. That that's a hard top we're seeing there, correct? Yeah, that's correct, Greg. That's the hard top. And there is an option for a non hard top. Uh, yeah, let me just pull up the option because <laughs> I was looking at something else there. Um, uh, yeah, there's the hard top, and then there's uh, fixed rubber dimini. Yes, but I don't think. Yeah, so it's an option to have it with or without the hardtop. Yep, very good. And it looks, it looks like they've fitted, uh, we haven't seen them, but those uh, viewing windows through the hardtop to be able to see the sails, and they look like those can be closed up as well. Yeah, they look great, those windows there. Um, and the other thing I really like about the sun lounge pad at the back there, it's quite, you're not you're not sort of precariously placed on the boat anywhere. You're quite well locked in with really good railing around. Um, previously on some other boats, um, you, you might feel a bit like you're sitting right up on the top and if you're in a seaway, it, you could roll off uh, if you're having a snooze in the sun, but here you're really well locked in, which is something I really like. And I also like the feature on the previous model in, in exiting the flybridge and going down behind the helm station that you it was a kind of ex an external stairway. So there was never any way of being completely weatherproof. Whereas if you see on the starboard side there, they've made that opening hatch down to the deck below, which is closable. Mm. So you've got a closable weather type hatch there. So at no point is any weather coming down into the cockpit. And in fitting clears to this flybridge or upstairs area, uh, you can transition between downstairs and up without being weather exposed. Mm, yeah. Look at the size of that uh, GPS readout. That's a beauty. You muted again, Bola. One of the new features on this uh, on the Fontaine de Jo Allegria and the Samana now is this glass windbreak, just here, or, or Perspex windbreak on the lower deck there. And then we'll just jump through. Forward cockpit, very large. Mm. And then uh, moving along and look, very heavy duty uh, set up there on the rig, gentlemen, in terms of uh, this, they haven't, uh, they haven't compromised. Is there any, is there any sail that fits on the inner force day or is he just there to uh, prevent pumping there? Uh, I believe there is an inner force day yeah. sail. I definitely know there's a Jenica out the front. Yeah, there, there is a space there. You can have that on the electric furler as well, Nod. So okay. your, your Genoa there, that's on an electric furler, which is great. You, you know, you can just press a button, the sail comes out, you press another one, it fills back up. Um, they're really reliable. Uh, you can have the same on the spacel, which is the slightly smaller sail, where, where Greg's got the mouse. Um, and that, uh, that's a, a smaller sail to have up in heavier winds, or you could set it as a spacel. Had, um, a, a Jenica or something off the end of the bowsprit. And one other feature we'll just point out while we're on this screen is the overhanging uh, cabin top to uh, give shade and to stop that solar heat penetration. So Greg, as well, while we're looking at that slide, so the, the bowsprit, is it standard on that model? Uh, it's, it's an option as well. Um, yeah, just having a look at it here, trying to find, uh, it is an option. I'm just trying to find how much it is, but I'll come back to you on that one in a second. Moving along, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've seen more of the bow, so we'll keep moving because we've had a good look at that already. Uh, now the cockpit, so I'll let you have a chat about that, uh, Nod. Okay, thank you, Greg. And slightly guessing here, other than the obvious that that table and seating area looks huge. Uh, I guess it followed the same configuration of the smaller models in stepping up, which has worked so well. Big seating area, 
on the left hand side of the cockpit, spare seating over on the right hand side there and then the transom seating across the back. That looks like a huge storage in the floor there, um, moving through the cockpit. Um, is that life raft storage or just general storage we're looking at? I think that's general as a rep. Yeah. And then one thing, we've had a comment from one of our uh, uh, people who had joined us today, just to say that from what they have seen, the front access door out into that front cockpit is a very strong, heavy duty, well manufactured door compared to what you might find on some of the uh, competing uh, production models. And the, the, stair, the staircase taking you up to the fly, uh, comparable to the, the one that was molded into the, uh, I guess, I guess the fly bridge moldings on the previous boat. It's quite narrow going up the stairs, but they certainly look quite wide and access looks wide enough and accommodating in going upstairs. Yeah. and. Um, the sliding doors there, uh, they look like they're about sort of 40 or, 40 or 50 percent bigger than what the previous model was. Um, so that real indoor outdoor flow um, is uh, a lot easier on this model. And then one other. When you look at the Ipanema, this is going to be probably the biggest step, I guess, in an evolution of a size because. The Ipanema was a modified Sanya 57, and when we go back from that, you know, that hull, basically all we did was put a flybridge on it. So the cockpit layout on, on the Sanya 57 it is, it's, it's old now, so this would be a significant step up in size compared to the previous model. And while we're on this screen on, on the port and starboard side there, you can see the access doors to the uh, cabins, which is here. And yep. here. So we'll move along to the next slide. Okay, so that's the same view looking back. The main feature that we see there that's popped into the screen is the, the, the additional cockpit fridge so up here. And you've got an ice maker and a fridge, and then you've got another fridge down there. So there's no shortage of fridge space on the lower uh, deck as well as upstairs on the flybridge. And the other thing that I like here is too, the, the lighting is all done very nicely and just the whole ceiling panel is done very nicely. It's all uh, very low profile, very uncluttered uh, ceiling to the and cockpit. Following on from that, Greg, it's also got an integrated cockpit tent. So there is the clears that fold down around that whole cockpit area to enclose it if you're in some weather. Um, but then when they're up like it, like it is now, it's, it's fully integrated. So you don't actually notice them while we're there. It zips away nice and neat. Um, and one other little feature while, while we're looking at it, um, there's an electric sunshade, which uh, you press a button and obviously it comes down the back. So, you know, if you're having some afternoon drinks and the sun was getting in your eyes, uh, you can press the button and, and down comes a sunshade just to block a bit of that uh, low level light coming through. They all recess into this ceiling, don't they? Correct, yeah, yep. Yep, okay, very good, I'll move along. Um, more cockpit, that's all right. It's a nice cockpit. Yeah. Uh, and it's obviously open plan, the way it integrates into the saloon. Mm -hmm. uh, let's stop here for a moment, uh, technical time not. So you've got your hydraulic platform there? Yeah, so as I talked from earlier, you can see the arms that move forward into the tunnel there. So comparable to the telescopic vertical lifting one, or sometimes, well, those either operated by electric motors or we have on other models where they're electric hydraulic, is this levering system, uh, I guess, is much stronger, allows us to lift bigger boats. And you can see there just that gap between the hulls when we get up to the 59, that sliding that four meter tender comfortably goes in there and that allows us to put, a four meter tender is a big tender. Um, most people, when they get to 3.6, are comfortable with the size of the boat. 3.8 is great. 4 is excellent. Um, also, on this model, when we go up from the 50 up, we actually accommodate a, what you call a proper dive ladder off the transom there, nice and secure. Got the handles to get in and out of the water. Much bigger unit. Uh, and there we go. And in answering my question earlier, that's where the life raft is stowed, just up there in the transom. So for if you ever had to evacuate, get off the boat, it's very easy access at the back. You can go onto the platform there, either undo the lashings or if you've got a hydrostatic on there or just uh, jettison from the back. Very good, okay. Um, and there's a few other features there. This is an option to have the extra cleats here. 
Uh, obviously, in under here is your cockpit shower, hot and cold, and probably a, a deck wash, I would assume, as well. These uh, capstan winches are also an option that you can choose, so that so that if you're coming up to a dock, you can uh, use your winch to uh, secure you alongside. So there's a number of features there, uh, bilge systems here and so on. So there's a number of features in that photo. Uh, and then here we are now, we're beginning to move towards the interior. Uh, and then this is a step down from the cockpit into the owner's cabin, which on the Allegri 67, which is the, the larger model of, of, of this range, the owner's cabin is in the forward starboard uh, part of the vessel. And there is a, an, a second access into that owner's cabin from the um, forward cockpit. But on the Samana 59, they've chosen to put the owner's cabin in the aft starboard hull. And in doing that, they've now got the second access into the owner's cabin. So the owners, uh, from the owner's cabin, you can wake up and you can come up the stairs there and go straight out onto the duckboard and uh, into the cockpit. Have a, have a morning dip as you wake up, Greg. Exactly that. <laughs> now, the big thing about the Samana 59 is that there, as is the same with the Allegra 67, uh, we get a bit technical here, but there's two uh, choices, a galley up or a galley down. And that's what we're showing on the screen there, the galley up on the left-hand slide. And then the, uh, the right-hand slide showing that if you have your galley down, it means that you therefore have more entertainment and seating space up in the, uh, in the saloon. Uh, regardless of which option you take, you get this bar here, this, uh, this swept back bar, and then you've got your helm station here. But I'll move on to the next slide because it's, so this here is a galley down. So for the photo shoots that they've done on the Samana 59 so far, they've been using the galley down version. So all of these images are galley down. We unfortunately don't have a galley up, although we may have one from the Allegra 67, just to give an example. Uh, but as you can see, lots of seating space there. Um, the flooring options, uh, and there is some color choice options in there uh, in what the Fontaine Bijou called the Millicene. Uh, so there is a, a little bit of choice and ability to uh, change the coloring and the internal uh, fitting uh, the internal look. So Greg, just, just in clarifying that, I've got the here. So when you've got the, the classic version, which we haven't touched on yet with the, the galley up, and this is the galley down we're looking at now, with that helm station, the lower helm station, is that optional with either? Good question. I d don't believe it is. Marcus, can you just, can, you've got the price, uh, the option sheet there in front of you today. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll, I'll have a look and come back to you. Just going back to the previous question, the, um, the uh, spine for the um, spinnaker is included in the base boat. And then I'll just come back to you on the, Home station uh, set up downstairs in a minute or two. Thank you. But um, but also just while we're looking at the sort of return there, uh, the fr the front of the, the saloon. You can, there's two options for that. You can have it set up with a freezer or a wine fridge in there. Um, two options to go there, and then that uh, table in the uh, in the middle. That that's electric, so it can go. Sorry, the other side on the port side of the boat, yeah, that's electric. So it can go up and down. And it actually folds out into a full-size dining room table as well uh, for about eight people, I'd say. Okay, very good. And now if we tick along here, and you can, you can sorry, I'll just sorry to keep jumping slides, but you can see just like they've done with the Elba 45, they've gone for this uh, rounded, uh, fairly uh, large radius, uh, cornering on the cabinetry rather than the sharp edge cabinetry. So that's just something that's carried on now. That's now been introduced across all of the Fontaine de Jo range. Uh, that's that uh, heavy duty door that uh, one of our uh, one of our clients has mentioned. And the uh, the lower helm station is on is standard on both versions. So I can confirm that. Nice. So yes, yeah. correct. You threw me then, Nod. So we'll, uh, we'll move on to the next slide. And now this here is, um, uh, that's not the galley up example, that's still a galley down. Um, 
So no, that's not an example <laughs> at all. <laughs> so we'll come to this one. So here we are, if some explanation. If you choose to have the galley up, you can have your owner's cabin here in the aft starboard, and then you can have one, two, three, four uh, full-size uh, guest cabins. If you choose to have the galley down, you therefore don't get the option of turning this into a double cabin. So it's a galley and the skippers or, or a, a double bunk guest cabin, and you have one, two, three, uh, two guest cabins and a master cabin. So that's if you go for the galley down. So this is why the galley up, and for many people, the galley up is the, the, the better choice because especially for uh, we're here in Australia, the Australian boating market tend to like to cook and entertain amongst each other. They don't like to be down below cooking and entertaining. Um, and so if, you, if, you're on a, a, if you're having a Samana 59 where you're going to sail it yourself and maybe not have too much uh, support from crew, uh, the galley up version is great. If you are uh, going to be purchasing a Samana 59 where you will be using crew, then that's often where the galley down option uh, becomes more favoured. So that's that there. You can yeah. see the socks. Sorry. Back to that previous slide there, Greg. When you do have crew, um, you know, on a, on a 60 foot yacht, it's not uncommon to have a, a skipper and a hostess live full time on, on the boat. Um, so they would, based in that sort of aft port cabin here with the bunks, they've got direct access into the galley to, you know, start making breakfast or what have you uh, without actually interacting with the guests as well. Um, so, and then they've also got access out the back and, you know, if they need to get up and move the boat in the morning or, or in the evening uh, and the sort of the guests and the crew can stay separate um, if, if you like. So it's been well thought out. If you are thinking of having a skipper on board the boat, they can uh, move around the boat freely without interacting with the guests if that's what would prefer. And on that note, Marcus, that's a very exclusive looking setup, isn't it? So an owner's cabin, two guest cabins, at, uh, with your crew uh, in their quarters, it, that's a, a very livable uh, layout, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. You've got, you know, separate toilets there, uh, big showers. It's, you know, it is a serious luxury, Greg, absolutely. If we okay. could, uh, just, just in that, if you did want the galley up so that when you're using the boat in your own private time, you've got that interaction. When you needed to have your boat crewed, you could still have the galley up version with all those cabins and yes. then fit, fit out the four peaks and put your crew in there, couldn't you? Exactly, and they're large crew cabins, or you could designate this cabin back here with a double bunk as a crew cabin as well. And then the, the four peaks could become additional if you had other couples with kids or anything like that. Exactly. So this here now that we're looking at is the galley up version with one, two, three, four guest cabins and the owner's cabin. And then here we are here, the five cabins. So that's still the owner's cabin. This is one, two, three, four without an owner's cabin. So this is a uh, galley down, crew living in, the, uh, in their quarters there, or you could have it for guests. You've also got the four picks fitted out and you've got four cabins with a galley down. And then here, uh, the piece of resistance is a galley up version with six guest cabins. Yeah. So they've got quite a few variations, which is good. I don't think we've ever, we've ever had that many configurations, have we, before? No, no, not that many ever. Yeah. And as you... The six cabin would be targeted towards the charter market uh, where your bums on seats become the, uh, the bottom line. Correct. Okay, so then moving along, this is the galley down galley, and that doorway behind the gentleman there is the doorway into his uh, cabin. Um, and you, you can see it, you know, on a boat of this size, you wouldn't expect anything less in terms of cupboard space, in terms of appliances, uh, and, and the ability to work within the space uh, without feeling cramped. It's very impressive. Now we're in uh, the owner's cabin, uh, the front of the owner's cabin on the starboard side of the vessel. Further forward through the doorway there, you can see the forward starboard guest cabin. 
Uh, so this is the front half of the owner's cabin. The TV does the old lift and raise out of the, uh, the cupboard there. Uh, you can see that the, the bunks, uh, the, all of the beds are the outward facing uh, beds. So if you sit in that bed there, you're looking straight out through those very large uh, windows. Mm -hmm. the, the windows are neatly integrated into the side of the boat um, for the aesthetics from the outside. It's just a, a really they, look, they look like extremely long windows. It looks like it's almost the full length of the cabin. They look fantastic. Yeah. And, and then looking aft from the owner, from the owners in the owner's cabin, you're then looking through into what is a open plan uh, stateroom with the uh, shower and toilet. And then as you can see there, the stairway up into the, uh, the cockpit. So this is now looking forward in the other direction. So you've got the storage and hanging space there, you've got mirrors, you've got a nice large sink and you've got a very uh, accommodating shower there and then just stepping back one just over on the right hand side is the entrance to the uh, separated lavatory uh, the toilet or the head double, double flower head there greg uh, which i thought was pretty cool and yeah also um cross ventilation too you've got a, a hatch at the uh above your head and a hatch at uh sort of eye level there so if you if you can dry it all out which is always good it's got to be an extremely big bathroom that the owners, you know, bathroom, showering, vanity. It's almost at the widest point of the boat back there. I mean, normally they tend to be up in the in the front or not cramped, but it, it must be a huge bathroom. This this is the guest cabin now on the starboard forward side. So you can imagine that just to the right hand side of this photo is the uh, the window opening, and in this hole the bathroom is forward, but one thing that's really incredible here, gents, is these are wide holes. Yeah, when you look at the walk around at the front of that bed, which, you know, is always at least the length of a standard queen, is in previous models, you could walk around the front of the bed, you've got that cabinetry where the TV might pop out, but it's not tight, but it looks like there's certainly plenty of walk around space there. Very good. Okay, and then this is the art port side cabin if you have the galley down uh, and this is what we're calling the crew cabin but it could also certainly just be a guest cabin uh, with the two single pullmans there um, and also again a very extensive bathroom so all of the bathrooms have a separate shower cubicle uh, so very very well laid out and just to confirm those are bad the, uh, the double beds are all clean size they're about Two meters by 1.6 approximately. Excellent. So, and that, that we've only got that one picture there, but all of the crew, I'm sorry, all of the guest cabins uh, in, uh, are of a similar size. If we click back a couple of slides here uh, to the dimensions, it might be going too far back there. So you can see that they're all quite close in size to each other. Yeah, they're all clean size beds. And you see that these two forward cabins here have the forward bathroom that we were looking at in that image. And then this cabin here has the bathroom here, which is a shower and toilet, uh, shower, toilet, shower, toilet. And then the guest, and then this one here, uh, I believe this cabin doesn't have a separate shower cubicle as such. Oh yes, it does right there. So you go into the shower there and then you've got your, your head there. So very, very well laid out and a lot of available volume. Now we'll just click through and I'll let you have a chat now, Nod, about the technical side of things here. Okay, so what we talked about at the start was we've got the two engine options there. So we've got the 110s or the upgrade to the 150s. We can see that we're running, uh, it looks like we've got reverse facing engines, then a, a V-sharp running aft. So, fixed shaft there and propeller. Um, on our smaller models, we run a configuration of the, the rudder forward of the sail drive. On this, we've got the standard configuration of the rudder aft because of water line length, we can afford to do it in the boat. That gives you better steerage or water over the rudders. Give you slightly better steerage than the other configuration. But yeah, you can see to save on space, 
uh, or give us more living space in the boat. We've got the engines the other way around. Uh, so the shaft would be coming you know, out the back of the gearbox facing forward through the speed drive and then back out aft. Uh, just looking on there, it looks like we've got gen set aft of the engine uh, above the water maker. So that's the water, the water maker. maker sitting above the main. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's a V drive all, system. All these yeah. just require men, uh, very easy to get to any side of the engine, the generator. Um, you know, maintaining these systems is quite easy uh, in a well laid out um, engine bay. Now on this screen here, uh, Nod, I think one thing that I've been impressed with with Fontaine Joe is that they, they, they are conscious of weight distribution around the boat and its impact on performance and stability and so on. So, you know, we find some models where we may have gen sets aft, other models where we have gen sets and water tanks forward. Um, so on this model, the, the thing that impresses me is the way they put all of the water tanks right in the uh, middle of the vessel there. I think in just the top of my head, and this is the first time I've really studied this slide, is what you're looking at here, Greg, and it is centralised, like if we can get all the weight close to the mass space, all the better, but we've put water tanks here, uh, it looks like underneath the floor in the tunnel there, and that's comparable to all the models prior. So we can have a nice opening front door and a walk through to the open, uh, I guess, four deck cockpit and single level. Previously, we have a mass base around that area and all the tankage underneath, but uh, they're kind of in behind the anchor locker. And uh, I guess you had that raised bulkhead. And so they were easy to accommodate there. And that's why those water tanks have moved up. We've got the fuel tanks in either hull, uh, obviously under the floor, which is keeping weight nice and low down. Um, and gas or black water, sorry. So we've got our waste up there on the starboard side. That's reasonably standard as per previous. Uh, we've got the batteries there. So it's 100 amp house bank. Um, and that's nicely centrally, centrally located as well. And having dual water heaters there means you're not standing around waiting for the hot water to come through in the morning for your shower. Uh, it's not too far from the source. Which is good. That's right. And then on this screen here, obviously the water maker, which is essential uh, almost on all Fontaine Joe models now. If, uh, we we rarely don't tick water maker. Uh, got the main gen set. The other thing you can do on the uh, on, on both the Samana and the Allegri is you can choose to have one large gen set, or you can choose to have two smaller gen sets synchronized. Uh, and the theory behind that is uh, you have a large gen set so that you can power all of your systems, including your air conditioning. But if uh, by having two gen sets separated and synchronized, it means if you're not running air con and, and everything, you can just run one and obviously therefore use less fuel and, uh, because you don't really need the, the, the large gen set running all the time. And also it just gives you that redundancy. Yes, exactly. Okay, so we'll move on. I think we're almost at the end. Um, so that's the video again. Uh, there is a video that people can watch. I do have this. So this is where we will just go and do a, um, a, a physical. I'm not sure if this will work so well because if you gentlemen let me know if you can't hear the sound, uh, I'll try it. I haven't got any sound my end, Greg. No, nothing with me. Can you hear anything there? No. No, okay, so this is Raman, who is the deputy CEO of uh, Fontaine de Joe over in France. And uh, about two months ago, he did this walkthrough. So we'll just follow him through the boat. Uh, he's, uh, he's not only got the really good job, but he's also hasn't been hit by the ugly stick. So he's, uh, he's going to walk us through the boat there and give us a look. And... Uh, Anyone can log on and view this video themselves as well, can they, Greg, on YouTube? Yes, yeah, it's available on YouTube, this video, but we just thought we'd bring it in just as a way of finishing today's discussion. Uh, one last look around. So, so just to confirm, the uh, the nav station there, that, that downstairs helm station is standard. And you would be able to, you can have a set of throttles there and you'd be able to control the... Uh, the boat with an autopilot remote um, or through the, the systems from that uh, lower helm station? 
Yeah, correct. And then, so he's now walking into the uh, master cabin here. Um, headroom is great. Uh, I think Roman's probably over six foot tall. So you can also see the aircon vents above his head there. So they're calling that the king size island bed, gentlemen. It's okay. bigger than a queen. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> It, it reminds me of the Saba 50 a little bit, uh, not the way in which the, uh, the, the bathroom there for the master is quite open plan. Yes. Yeah, that was, mm -hmm. the, that was the previous one where you came in and had the, uh, the toilet and the shower separate alongside, wasn't it? Yes, yes. I think a lot bigger though, Greg, like I was saying, if you went onto a Saba 50 now, you'd be surprised how small it was. <laughs> Well, we still want to. And that's why we're sitting here talking. In the next two weeks, we're going to have all the new pricing and uh, 3D renders and information for the uh, replacement of the Saba 50, which will be near, uh, for now, we'll call it the new 51. So we're looking forward to getting that shortly. There's a, little, a lot of people are waiting to see that pricing. And importantly, while we're talking about that new 51, from what we understand, it will still have the helm station, the uh, offset helm station, like all of the smaller models it's just the samana and the allegria that have the full flybridge yeah we were touching on this yesterday weren't we greg when we were just having a quick review of the bike we were going to be talking about is that it's still when you get 50 uh, and and smaller that configuration of that that helm downstairs or intermediate helm on your way up to the, the sun lounge area on the roof it, it allows everyone to still interact together and you're not standing alone on a, on a flybridge that cannot accommodate everybody to join you upstairs whereas as i touched on earlier this configuration of this flybridge which roman is showing us here is everybody can transition to upstairs comfortably while underway and spend the whole day up here yeah that's really important isn't it uh nod that um, you know everybody can be as one whether it's uh whether you're downstairs or all upstairs or, or with a split for the helm station uh in between you've got to be able to communicate and, and be in touch with everybody and it's really funny you say that nod because even on the elba 45 i was out sailing on that uh in sydney a few weeks ago and everyone's in the uh down in the cockpit as soon as the sails have gone up and we're out sailing there's no one downstairs. Everyone's up in that lounge area. Once the yep. boat's in sailing mode, everyone gravitates upstairs, and I'm sure it would be exactly the same on the Samana. Okay, so listen, we've come to the end of today's presentation. Thank you, gentlemen. I know that was uh, uh, it's a bit challenging when we physically haven't been on the boat yet. Um, it, it makes it harder for us, but I, I, we, we believe that we needed to do something especially as there's no English speaking reviews of the Samana 59 that we could find yet. So it's great that we've now put together this presentation that we can have on YouTube and have as a resource. Um, thank you for those who've joined us today. We hope that's helped. Uh, if you've got any inquiries, please just drop us an email or give us a call. Um, and I'll just go here. Uh, any final words, gentlemen? No, I think I'm done. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. I just well, had a question. Um, someone asked if we could have uh, in-boom furling, um, and that is a, an option we can put on the boat um, so you, you don't have to sort of climb up into the lazy jacks or anything like that to unzip the boom bag. And while you're on that, some other questions too is, or other features around the rig. Uh, it's an important one there, Marcus, is that you can also have the painted white mast and boom or... Uh, and you can also have the hydronet sails, the performance sails. I'm just going back to the original image there of, of the boat sitting there. So you can also, um, so you can see that vessel's got the, the white painted boom. It's got what they call the canoe boom, which just has those flares on it. So that when, with the lazy bag, when you're dropping the sail, it captures the sail uh, more easily and stops the sail from draping uh, outwards or bust, bursting outwards from the uh, sail bag uh, and the hydronet sails is the other option of course the Elba 45 that Gordon and Louise sailed across from La Rochelle 
to Australia early this year has the Hydronet sales and uh, considering how many miles that yacht has now done with its sales up. And as you would know, you were on that boat last Monday, Marcus, those sales are in, still in great shape. Okay, we just got a question here, Greg. When will we see the Samana 59 in the Asia Pacific region? Oh, very good question. Um, we hope to have one here in 2022, unfortunately. Uh, so the, 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 the smarter opportunity for Australians and New Zealanders and uh, our Asian clients to see the Samana 59 is that uh, all things going well with COVID and with vaccines is that we would hope that at the Cannes Boat Show next September, uh, everyone can congregate there and we can uh, see the boat and hopefully after the show or before the show arrange some test sailing. Uh, so that's, uh, unfortunately, that's that's where we're at. Okay, so listen, very good. Well done, gentlemen. Um, and uh, thank you, Rachel, in the background there. I just need to check there that we haven't got any unanswered questions. Um, so yeah, very good. We'll, uh, we'll leave it at that and we'll see everyone in two weeks' time to uh, talk about the Whit Sundays. But for now, we're going to uh, stop this presentation. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, guys, and thanks for joining us, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Thanks, for everyone, for joining. Thank you.